prop. I've got a spring in my step today, <laughs> even with a walking stick, because it's an incredible occasion for me and at last a time to celebrate. As chair of the working group on the Australian Soil Classification, it's an absolute privilege to announce the release of the Australian Soil Classification third edition to the soil science community. Now today, Noel Shocknick and I are going to discuss what it took to achieve and illustrate some of the more important changes, uh, and there are many changes compared to previous editions. Just forgive us if we tend to drop into the shortcut, shortcut uh, acronym for Australian Soil Classification of the ASC. It's not changing. Can't get it to change. That'll help? Okay. Right, just at the start of the presentation, we've got three key messages for you. Um, there's many changes, so we recommend that you put your old versions out to pasture or up on the back shelf somewhere where they can be an archive and gathered as. Um, be aware that there are four new versions you can get access to now, and three of them for the first time are free. not what I want. That's missing. Oh no, here we go. Um, the third edition was a team effort and I want to warmly acknowledge those colleagues who contributed in a major way. Uh, the working group undertook the challenging task of assessing the many proposals submitted to enhance it and it appears it appeared for a long time to be a never-ending journey. Uh, but many people across the country helped to shape the third edition. So we're very grateful to them. There's more acknowledgements because we have Ray Isbell, who is a bit of a star, brilliant mind, and he created his greatest legacy, which is probably this Australian soil classification. And he achieved that by forensically looking at databases and tirelessly listening to the soil science community, some of the best minds, and um, if the ideas were a good fit, he incorporated those concepts into the ASC and the working group, we've tried to follow his lead by listening intently to suggestions from the soil science community and debating their value, their relevance and consequences. And we can't list you all at this time, but on behalf of the working group, we thank you for your contributions. Now, the working groups had a big advantage over Ray in the amount of soil data that we could work with. Over 22 years, been a tenfold increase in the available soil profile data a huge improvement, near 140,000 sites compared to 14,000 when he was, he was dealing with it. So it's taken seven years since the initial proposal by Noel at the 2019, 2014 National Conference to create, and his proposal was to create an arena sole soil order. And through the working group, the third edition has become much more than just adding the arena soles. I say just adding it, that was big enough. But we've reviewed in front forensic detail as much as we can for consistency and clarity and upgraded uh, it by a lot of introducing new terms and consulting uh, quite closely with the uh, Yellow Book team, the Yellow Book working group led by Andrew Biggs, who uh, is now, review now updating uh, that uh, document as well. And because the changes are substantial and to test them, uh, there was feedback sought from the, command, from the soil science community on many occasions, several occasions, and uh, we think that helped us along the way. So even with the addition of a new soil order, the third edition still retains its essential simplicity. It's only got 15 soil orders, which makes conceptual understanding and visualisation relatively quick and easy. And I've heard time and again from people who have travelled overseas, like Ben Harms, Noel himself, and uh, Alex McBratney, that they can, at, when they go to um, field days uh, overseas, and they can usually fairly quickly and confidently classify soil pits according to the ASC. Whereas using other international systems, people are still arguing for hours later. So what's been the result with the third edition? If you go to Appendix 7, there are nearly 50 more noteworthy amendments. 
So we're going to have to restrict our talk today to just a few of the important ones. Uh, changes have been made to the, the key in, at various levels in the majority of soil orders, some fairly minor, some fairly significant. So let's just talk about the effect of the arena soil soil order. It created consequences for other soil orders. And just to give you an example, to key out kerosols before arena soils, we wanted to keep the main structures much the same. We tried to, many attempts to avoid using a negative. Because if you've seen it in the World Reference Base and Soil Taxonomy, they use negatives a lot and they have very tortuous sentences to try and uh, use it. And it becomes very difficult to read. Reluctantly, the only word, wording that unambiguously worked was one of exclusion. You might also note that the phrase grade of pedality in candesols and elsewhere has replaced the term soil structure. And the reason for that is to align with the wording in the yellow book. They, why they have a theme of soil structure, when they talk about whether it's structured or not, they say the grade of pedality, the grade of pedality is medium or strong. The Candesol's definition now also excludes reference to a tenic B horizon and organosols I'll cover in the next slide. So here, this modification addresses the issue of blanket peats. They occur wi very widely in the landscapes of southwest Tasmania. They even can run along over boulders as a thin layer. And the previous editions of the ASC, a shallow peat overlying rock or gravel was classified as organosol, but if it went to an adjacent peat which overlied a bit of thin layer of clay over rock, it became a hydrosol. And so the third edition now classifies both those soils as organosols. And so what we've got here is um, uh, uh, both soils on the extreme are overlying rock, they're organosols, the one in the middle overlying a bit of thin clay is also an organosol. So a further addition has been using those uh, distribution maps, adding them to the start of each soil order. And you might note that they indicate dominance and also we used, we couldn't think of another word of not pres present but not dominant other than subdominance. But it does mean that you've got two levels of abundance, one where the soil order is expected to be the dominant soil order in that landscape and the other where it's present but it's not dominant. So it gives you a guide on where to find each soil, soil order and the level of abundance. Now the Tenic B concept has been removed and the reason is it's a very multifaceted concept that doesn't lend itself easily to classification, especially in a key. And it can be a point of argument and contention amongst even experienced pedologists. And it certainly has overwhelmed students participating in soil judging competitions. And I can give you a, an explanation of why. Uh, if you do a review of the 96 word definition um, based on seven readability formulas, it's concluded to be extremely difficult to read. And one index described it as impossible to comprehend. <laughs> so you can see why it was problematic. Okay, another change has been the adding of uh, water repellents. It's a dramatic, got a dramatic impact on infiltration and plant performance. Uh, and so the degree of water repellents is an important surface or property. Fits very well into the family level of, of classification. Um, so it applies mainly now to, at the family level, to soil orders that may have sandy textured A horizons. The term diagnostic features used a lot in the soil classification, but it's nearly all buried in the general text. So we've pulled it out and put it into the glossary of terms and also given some guidance on its applicability to when it occurs at depth. For instance, if you've got a clay uh, horizon at two metres or a ferric horizon, ironstone gravels at two metres, should it, should it apply or not? You have to make a judgment call and there's some guidance on that. Now we come to the big one, oh, before we get to the big one, sorry, consistent use of metric units. Um, the working group found there was very inconsistent use in previous editions. So 
we've used a dimension of 0.1 metres or 100 millimetres as the logical cutoff. So anything that's 100 millimetres or less in size is in millimetres. Anything that's 0.1 metre or larger is in metre units. Very simple thing, but just creates a consistency through the, the document. And so now we come to the big bit with uh, the new soil orderers on, uh, of, of arena soils. There's more. Now, this initial ins in inspiration was from Noel uh, that started the whole thing with the third edition, and we can appreciate it's a mega change. You don't do something like this lightly. So Noel's going to go through the reasoning for some of the de and some of the detail behind it, and he'll conclude by showing you where you can get copies of it and also some of the things that we are thinking of will enhance things in the future. Over to you, Noel. Well, thank you, Bernie. Oh, oh. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Woohoo, we've published the next edition. And Bernie's mentioned it was at the 2014 uh, conference in Melbourne, for those of you who were there, that I put forward a proposal for a new order because there are sandy soils all throughout uh, Australia and people talk about them. I've heard in this conference already many presentations talking about deep sandy soils. I heard it on the radio, you talked to farmers. It's a very well understood group, but it wasn't easily identified in the previous edition. But when we took it on, we realised there were quite a few other inconsistencies in the publication. So we've actually had a total rework of the, of the publication to get this new one. So why? So um, Bernie mentioned that, uh, showed the data that the information we have at hand has increased dramatically. When Ray Isbell did the first edition, it was largely Queensland and South Australian focused because that's where CSIRO had their information. And a lot of the regional surveys, as the decade of landcare sort of work, wasn't, the data wasn't available. So WA, with all its sands, we're called sand gropers, right, um, really wasn't included uh, well, I believe, in the, in the publication. So the, this group that is well understood across the community, the deep sands, were easily identified and understood. Previously, they were in three soil orders. The calcareous soils, tennis soils, and rooter soils. And often it was an arbitrary split to which one to put them in. And the tennis soil order has always had problems for me because it is a poorly understood group of a wide range of soils in the previous edition, which I called the leftover soils. Because if you, went, if you go through the key, the tennis soils are defined as other soils. They're not actually defined in the key, they're just what you're left with. And then you go to the tennis soils and there's an attempt to explain the, the variety of soils are in there. And I call them the leftover soils. So one of my uh, aims was to reduce the variability within the tennis soil order. And one of those was to bring the um, sands out. So there's a long, it's, as I mentioned, these are easily identified, understood and have characteristic properties they're well understood, and the culprits are land management managers, gardening experts, the general population, and even soil scientists talk about deep sands. So it is pretty well, well used. Um, uh, I mentioned that in 2014, I put forward that proposal, and we found that there's a lot of literature linked around sands, and there's a few. Life's better with sand between your toes. In every grain of sand, there's a story of the earth. So what are the sands? Now, I brought some props with me today. I went to Bunnings and I've got some saw monoliths of, of arenosols. I have a, a yellow arenosol here, which is a bit of a roll of sandpaper. And I have a red arenosol. So it's very easy to carry around monoliths of, of arenosols with you. You don't need to do a big thing. I can sell these to you if you want to buy them off me. So, sorry. <laughs> so, what is an arenosol? Well, it, the definition is more is explained in more detail in the publication, but it's basically a metre of sand dominated by sand. No layer or horizon has clay content exceeding 15%. It doesn't have a lot of coarse fragments, 
and there's no hard layers within that one metre. The interesting thing is this is the first time that a depth criteria has been brought into the ASC. Until this, there was no, we could go to any depth, and that caused some problems for people as well, because at what depth do you, do you characterise? If you're digging down, you see something at two metres, is that part of the soil profile? We actually, I think Bernie, in one of the previous slides, we gave some indications on what soil depth will you use in your classification, and we actually give some flexibility to actually not include things in the classification that occur within one and a half metres of the soil, or below one and a half metres of the soil surface. Okay, so it's basically at least a metre of sand is, an, is a rhinosol. We, as Bernie mentioned, we did have to exclude sands from the calcare soils. So the rhinosols have no impact on the orders above. If you've got a sand over clay, it's still a chromosol or you know, soda sol, even if that sand is one and a half metres deep. If you've found clay and you think that's part of the profile, you can still call it a uh, chromosol, for example, even if the sand is more than a metre deep because it keys out first. It's only when you get to the end and you've taken into all the other options and you've got a deep sand that it fits into the rhinosol group. So it's very important that we didn't want to have an impact on the podosols or the deep sandy uh, duplex soils. It's when you get towards the end and you've still got a deep sand. Here of sands, these are from Western Australia. This is um, a very well understood sand. It had a lot of common names. Uh, one one uh, interesting name is called gutless sand, um, spillway sand, silver loam. I think that's a bit of a uh, dreaming. Uh, Christmas tree sand, because the Christmas tree grows on these sandy soils and banksias. But you can see in the top, they're 1.4 metres. It's got a bit of organic matter of the surface, but basically it's just a deep sand. Previously, this could have been identified as perhaps a rudisol or maybe a tenosol. They come in a variety of colours, as per, as per the uh, match. good match. So in the wheat belt, you, um, and I'll just, I'll, I'll, when I get to the key, I'll just talk about the, uh, the, some of the enhancements we've added to the Renaissance order. But you can get yellow deep sands, red deep sands. I've just driven through the centre of Australia to get here. And I saw lots of red deep sands or red Renaissance. And there's brown ones, uh, which may be perhaps on a river flat. Here's a yellow one from our wheat belt, which would have been a yellow, basic arenic yellow orthic tenosol. Um, in the original Ray Isbell's first edition, there wasn't a colour option for sands. Um, that was brought in in the revised edition. But there's a yellow um, arenosol, they're subject to wind erosion. Oops. Uh, there's a um, coastal dunes. Uh, up around Lancelin, which is north of Perth. And there's the red sand dunes, which I mentioned as we went through, I saw those, I went through the, um, the centre of Australia. But I can't let you get away without talking about the whitest beach competition, right? Ah. Now, many of you have heard this before, but we did run a little competition when I was chairing the... Um, the National Committee on Soil and Terrain, to find the whitest beach in Australia. I won't go through the detail, but um, New South Wales had made a false claim they had the whitest beach. There it is. That's the winner at the moment, Lucky Bay in WA. Beautiful, beautiful place. And up the top there, you can see all the different sands to, for comparison. You can see, even though they all look white, you can see how Lucky Bay is the whitest. Um, I guess the point I made with it in that competition was that we have these amazing beaches throughout Australia, so it's something we should appreciate. But it's not until you put them next to each other you notice that they do vary in colour slightly. Um, sorry, just on that, I'm happy to take challenges, OK? <laughs> so the distribution, it ends up, when we did the distribution map, we found that it's now the largest soil order by area on our distribution map. So there was good reason, I think, to pull it out and to demonstrate them. You can see they're widespread throughout Western Australia, through the arid, basically arid interior, um, northern parts of South Australia, and there's bits and pieces in Queensland, but it's not a major soil. The Simpson Desert is, is in, the, in that corner there. So the Great Sandy Desert up there. 
there's bits on the coast. Um, and that's the Victorian, no, is that the Victorian desert? Uh, help me. There you've got the little desert, big desert there. What's that bit there, Bernie? Oh. Something sandy. Something sandy. <laughs> so, <laughs> they're widespread. Okay, now, the mo this is the good news. It's now available in four formats, right? Previously, you had this, plus there was a web version, publishing website, which I'll go to in a second. So the PDF is just a, a digital copy, exactly the same layout, the same look as the book. But the EPUB is, um, you know, it's more of a, it's a nice thing to take and put it on your tablet, you can take it out in the field with you. And it, you can vary the size of text and do things you can't do in the PDF. Um, and it's also available as a web um, key, which I'll go to in a minute. But there you are, this is the CSR publishing website. You can buy the book if you want to go old school. Oh, the other thing we, we said, we wanted the book to open flat because the previous publication used to keep closing on you, right? Very annoying. You want field books that actually lay flat so you can use them. But, but if you don't want to get this dirty, you can have a PDF for free or an EPUB for free. It's there to download and to take and put on any app, a device you wish. Um, that was one of the requirements of this new publication, was to get it out there so it make it available. We have the, the web version used to sit on the CSRO website. We've now moved all our standards to Source Science Australia. So Source Science Australia are hosting our standards. And if you go to the Source Science Australia homepage, you'll see across the top a standards tab. We're there. This is a page. Now, I've just given the, uh, the this sort classification, but all the other standards, like the yellow book, all the all the publications which we uh, we use are now available via a standards page, and we're going to expand that over the years to come, and make them all digitally available. So these things, like the yellow book, if you're familiar with, is not available in digital format. It's going to come out in all these new formats for you now, so you can take it in the field, and they're all going to be cross-linked in the same terminology. It's a new beautiful world. Okay, so this is the web, 100% free, web version. And I'm now going to test the technology here. I've got to turn it on. And I'll click on here. Right. Okay, so if you go into the Soil Science Australia site, we now have this um, digital key Oh, well, it's not. How do I get that to show? Sorry. Are you doing that for me? Yeah. Oh, thanks. I'll, can you do that again? Will I open it up again? Yeah, it's up on the screen. Okay, so I can enlarge that, can I? I can't see it on here, that's all. That's going to be a challenge. I just I can't see it here. Okay, so working over my shoulder, this is the home page. So when you go to the Source Science Australia site and you click on the classification, the standards, you get to it. And it's all there, it's just beautiful. It's beautiful. It's all there, all hyperlinked. So you can go down, I'll go down to my favourite, of course, so I'll go down to Arena Souls. All the terms we're using here are hyperlinked to the glossary. And the plan is now to start to make this an illustrated glossary. So we're going to put pictures, diagrams, videos. We'll have texturing videos, how to, pay, how to do all the different things in the field. All this will be available. So if, for, if you're in the field and you've got, um, you can get access to the web, you'll be able to have these things online. Ultimately, we'd like to have them. Oh, thanks very much. So now I can now see it on the screen here. Um, Ultimately, we'd like to have all the things available on, in an EPUB type thing. So we can go through and you, and you can cross link, you can look at what a B horizon in. So we've expanded the definitions here, probably double the number of things that were in the previous publication. We've also cross linked it to the yellow book so that there was, before the terms were used slightly differently. We now want to make sure all the terms are used exactly the same. So you can play around here and you can, um, you can look at the terms. I've got a nice little colour diagram here for your colour classes. 
I think, I think the illustrated glossary, which is going to expand over time, is going to be one of the most valuable aspects of the new key um, that you'll be able to... So this is basically the book in a HTML version. I now have access to the Source Science Australia website. Thank you, Michael. So I can edit this and I'll start adding in and building up the product to go with it. So that's a, I think that's an exciting uh, uh, addition or uh, development in this uh, classification. And of course, as I said, it's all free. So if I close that down. Right. So to finish up then, Bernie, would you, we, as you know, you've always got to say your key messages twice. There's lots of changes, right? So don't give your old version to your students. Don't give it to uh, somebody else because it won't be relevant. Put it in the bin. Sorry about that. Grab one of the new versions, three of which are free, no cost whatsoever. And the digital version on the Source Zone Australia website will be updated with pictures, diagrams, videos to help explain it. And it'll be an active and uh, live uh, publication. So I hope you all embrace the new publication and thank you for listening. <laughs> Any questions? No. Uh, actually, thank you for that, Vanessa, because <laughs> we're getting Henry's here, but I've, I've asked, uh, asked Tim Overhoy, can I put a proposal forward to have... See, the trouble is, in the state soils, we have two chromosoles. Uh, I think it's New South Wales and Western Australia have a chromosole. Here's a huge opportunity for WA to be on its own with an arenosol as a state soil, and I'll be pushing for that. Thank you. So another question? Well, I think Henry and I need to have a discussion about that. Who's got the soda soul at the I think Victoria's got the soda soul. New South Wales has got a chromosome. And WA has a chance to have its own, very own soil order. And if you look at the distribution map by area, there's good reason to make it in a renaissance. Sorry, so you, how did we generate the maps? The, the maps of the dominant soil orders across Australia? Yes. Were they based on the animal size map or the soil orders? Well, the, that's an interesting point because it's actually built on the Atlas of Australian Soils. Now, we, we had an attempt using the TURN Australian Soil and Landscape Grid to generate the, the maps of dominant, but there wasn't enough information and enough sites to actually generate a sensible map out of it. So we, we actually um, got the old Atlas of Australian Soils in the 60s, and we went through, because that lists a description as well as the, um, the main soils, and Bernie and I went through each of them and reviewed them and, and allocated a dominant or one or more subdominant soils to each atlas unit. And then we aggregated those subdominants up and made the new map. So quite a lot of work went into that. I'm not saying it's perfect by any means, but it's only meant to be a sort of an indication. And uh, maybe down the track, we'll, we'll update those um, with newer products. But I think we're pretty comfortable with them at the moment. Oh, no, I haven't, I haven't got my app with me. Can somebody got the app open and they can ask the questions? One sec. What's the process of changing the state soil? Well, these, well that's, it's a branch. The WA branch would have to decide. It's been, um, it's been the, the Chrome itself quite a while, but it was, but, because at the time there was no really other option. Um, what I'll do is I'm going to put a proposal to the WA brands to consider, and hopefully we'll get a new soil for the state soil. I've got a question for you. Yep. Uh, there's a bunch before we go through them all. Um, from Lauren O'Brien, is water repellents not sunblock safe? Because water repellents are 
Oh, well, the, the family cried too, oh, for sure. I mean, the thing with the sands, it was, it was driven because of sands. The water repellents is a really major feature of sand soils, and there's been a whole lot of GRDC research on non-wetting and you know, germination, and, and um, we felt that it was an important thing to, to capture if you saw it. But of course, with any soil profile description, it's time, you know, you, you record a whole lot of other things, including the time, that you, the day you actually recorded it. But we thought it was a very important feature of the soil, which you could have the option to record. But yeah, yeah, I mean, a lot of, some of these things are temporal and will change. I mean, organic matter, we record the uh, organic um, level, that can change as well. But I think it's an important feature. So we added it to all the soils that were likely to have a non-wetting issue. I got a question from Luke Mosley. <laughs> Has Mars got perennials? Well, I nearly put a photo of Mars in last night. <laughs> because I don't know if you remember, about uh, eight years ago when I was doing the soil calendar, I put a photo of these red soils and Mars as one month, because I was thinking outside the box and let's go extraterrestrial. And last night I thought, maybe I should just slip in that photo of Mars. So tell Luke, uh, yes, they probably read a renaissance on Mars. Um, well, Tim Overhoy, it's more of a comment than a question. Time for another why does the beach come? <laughs> well, tell Tim, I've got a sample from the Kimberley to challenge Lucky Bay. Well, in the, yeah, that, in the definition, in the glossary, there's a definition of what a hard layer is. So you'd have to go to the definition. And that's hyperlinked from the, um, you know, when you go to the key, there's a hyperlink to what hard is, and that's in the definition. So all the terms that are used are defined in the glossary. Well, yeah, well, let's, I'm open for... <laughs> well, if it's the, the blackest vertisol, Queensland's got, a, got that laid down. <laughs> yes, um, actually, I talked to Michael about this as a possible opportunity. You know, we've been doing the calendar each year. Maybe we need to perhaps invest in a new soil science um, orders cal calendar, a poster. Peter Watson and I have been talking about updating the stuffing orders. Yeah, well, Peter, Peter Wilson was going to get an Arenasol. Um, I was going to provide a photo, then we thought it wasn't appropriate. And, you know, yeah. But, yeah, I, th I think it would be a great opportunity with all this new information to create a new poster of the soils of Australia. It would be fantastic. And I think we can do that as a Soil Science Australia project. I think it'd be very popular. See, CSIRO had taken the lead in the past on all these things. They're not really in that space anymore. That's why we're migrating the standards from CSIRO for soil science. And it links into the accreditation process for CPSS. I think it's a neat fit and that's where it's going. Yeah. You, you might notice in terms of standards, if you go to the Soil Science Australia website, that you know, under that standards is not just the classification, but also the Yellow Book Standards, the book the standards associated with chemical methods, the standards associated with soil physical methods, uh, and also reference and linking to the national standards of acid sulfate soil assessment and management. So we're trying to sort of bring this all together of what national standards are expected into the one uh, place. There are some preliminary discussions at the moment We're looking, yeah, that's right. Um, that's a little way down the track, I think, but it'll be great, um, Bigsy, to get the yellow book up as a um, multi format digital product linked into the ASC.
most of what we're doing is a visual science. The yellow book doesn't have a picture in it. So we're creating pictorial guides to some of the key components of the yellow book. Service condition, uh, micro-leaf, uh, structure, some of the things that the picture really does tell a thousand words. And these will, will host all these things on the so Soil Science site with the publication. So it's, uh, I think it's uh, a good advance um, and hopefully, hopefully you all get to enjoy it, OK? Thank you.